Welcome to GUI Anti Mover Browsers Weekly Call uh, for the last day of this month. Uh, I'm here with uh, Dietrich and Hack, and let's uh, jump to agenda. If anyone wants to add something, feel free to do so. Um, I've added two first two items, so I quickly go over them, and then we'll uh, go spend some more time on the rest. So the first one, should companion recover from missing local gateway? Uh, so for a background, we are working on improving resilience in like offline or like uh, censorship, and uh, maybe not driven, but like impacted environments. So if a request for IPFS resource fails um, due to HTTP error or network error, uh, a request to a public gateway, we recover from that and that will land or it landed in the latest beta, we, which uh, soon uh, will be published to Chrome Web Store and Firefox AML. Uh, but basically, we recover requests for resources at the public gateway. And the question is what happens if local gateway goes offline? Maybe it was shut down, maybe it crashed. How companion should act? In theory, we could do similar thing. If request to local gateway failed, we could recover an open resource uh, using public gateway. Um, this is like a seamless experience, the potential con for this is that it will leak information about which resource user was trying to open. It will leak that information to the public gateway user has in settings set as a public gateway. Uh, so that's like an open question. I wanted to uh, broadcast if there are other, like, other considerations apart from this like privacy leakage uh, should, or like how UX should work. Uh, should that is it okay for this feature to be enabled by default, but behind like a toggle so people privacy conscious people can disable this behavior? So those are like questions I wanted to uh, highlight. Uh, and uh, like ad hoc thoughts on that? I don't think so. It's do we have an enough local? gateway usage like what's the what is the level of of threat i guess every user with uh ipfs desktop is basically using local gateway okay uh, when we install ipfs companion it checks if local gateway runs if not it the, on the welcome screen we explicitly ask people to install ipfs desktop or go ipfs and basically we communicate that that's the default mode you should be using IPFS companion as a companion to IPFS desktop daemon. Um, so I feel most of IPFS companion users will be running local gateway, but they, sometimes they will shut it down, forgot to run it, or maybe they, they bookmarked uh, a link to local gateway, but the local gateway is no more. Um, so I'd say like most of companion users will be having uh, this gateway. We don't have stats how many like requests to local gateway failed because we are not tracking user uh, actions right. with companion at, at least. Can, uh, does desktop have a log of where requests are coming from? So like does desktop know that it's, it's companion requesting? No, it doesn't. We could add, like, assuming those APIs do not disappear in manifest v3, uh, we could add a special header informing local gateway that this request comes from web browser with IPFS companion. So we could do that. We don't do that uh, yet. But how would that information be useful? It would, like, the implementation of IPFS, for example, would need to somehow use that information to make it useful. 
Yeah, so you would have to like expose this information to through like to the country somehow. The problem is like you are able Yeah, that's to, that's pretty complex yeah. at that point. Yeah, yeah, and it's like uh, also the problem is we would be able to track requests that reached um, like local uh, gateway. We won't be able to log requests which failed. That thing needs to be logged at the companion level. So we are back to uh, com like tracking uh, companion level. So the, the, I, th I think f really maybe focusing on what the end user is trying to do might give us the best answer here. Um, yeah, the, so the, the exposure, especially in the censorship mitigation, so it's, it's, they, they really do want to get to that content and that's yeah. probably the most important thing. Um, but some of the design work that we have around letting them know the relative risk of doing that is going to maybe help the situation and mitigate the level of danger there. Cause I think you're right. Like there is an, ex a, a leakage and exposure. Um, if you're just constantly sending out these CIDs out to the gateway that were intended to remain private, but yeah. without knowing why the user loaded it in the first place, that's very difficult to determine. Yeah, it may, may be that it's feasible to do this as an opt-in. Because um, like, like leaking in this kind of information as a default, uh, we can just like Tor project cannot assume people are reading all their docs and understand it fully. Uh, I don't think, th there's a risk that people make certain assumption if we say that companion is able to recover from like censorship. Um, I think there's like a deeper discussion around. Uh, well, well, one 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 thing also. Um, what let's say that the connection is made to the local gateway, and in the case of everything's working, local gateway's up. Companion makes the request to the local gateway. Local gateway makes that. Then you that top, that's talking to your desktop node, and then your desktop node makes that broadcasts that CID to the public network at that point, right? If it doesn't have the CID, its default action is to essentially do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the information leakage that happens at uh, the IPFS level is sort of like, I, I want to like box it. I, I want to like keep the, that sort of separate because we could imagine there would be a private pr uh, profile in IPFS which runs only, let's say, Tor transport, does not, has uh, ephemeral peer ID each time it starts and things like that. And then the only like leakage vector would be, would remain in companion. Uh, yeah, but at that point, like you really need to have more explicit configuration and communication around that to begin with. Like companion and desktop would have to have a much stronger negotiated like communication at that point so that the user using companion knows that they are protected in that way. So I feel like you're going to solve that problem in the UX explicitly yep. in that case, no matter what. Yeah. So I think you are right at this stage, how our transports and how our like reprovider announce, like announcing everything you have locally to DHT. Uh, if we recover from local gateway, we effectively do not leak anything more than IPFS node leaks right now. Yep. I think it may be a, bit, a way to describe it is we don't leak any more than we would if IPFS is working optimally as designed. Yeah. And that those, there are, there are the, the, that design we know is a known problem that we need to fix. Yep. It makes sense. And uh, if there, if we add this like privacy mode uh, at some point in the future, we then would like disable this behavior, uh, detect that. All right. Uh, I think that's enough for that. Uh, let's move to the next one. Uh, I try to make this even shorter. Uh, so uh, we are publishing our browser extension to both Mozilla and Google stores. Uh, so every Chromium-based uh, web browser is basically installing uh, a sign package from Chrome Web Store and uh, uh, Google is in the process of like introducing new set of uh, web extension APIs, which 
significantly change uh, the capabilities of extensions and uh, those new APIs are not even published yet nor we know what to really expect there is no nightly chromium build which enable us to play with it yet however uh, chrome web store already started making life uh, more difficult if your web uh, extension is using those powerful apis so it's very unfortunate for us because we we have both a beta and a stable channel on chrome web store and right now due to the fact that we use those powerful apis every new every release both beta and stable goes into this in-depth review queue which means instead of like being published within one hour it may take now multiple days or weeks before the published version is available to the public uh, that also impacts brave integration uh, because uh, that toggle in brave is using chrome web store as a means of distributing uh, uh, the sign package um, so that's that's unfortunate especially for the beta channel because i released a new uh, beta today and the problem is it's not on the chromium web store i believe uh, at least it was not before this call so i released it two hours ago and maybe it is nope it's still in review so that's uh, that's the problem like you know on firefox it's available immediately because we are self-hosted um, on chrome we use uh, chrome web store for our distribution of the beta channel and i think we are not able to meet, do anything about this maybe we could switch to self-hosted beta um this is the most mostly a psa in case someone wants to try the latest beta on, or stable uh, or sees there's a new companion version, but it's not available for Chrome. Uh, that's why it may take a week or more uh, to be published. And we're still trying to figure out how to mitigate that. Um, I think that's it from me. It's, a, it's only going to get harder. Uh, yeah, it's like... This is, this is the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, as a, uh, it, it, it's, I understand changes of APIs and things like that, but it's like a bit frustrating that we are being like punished, but we are not provided with APIs uh, that replace those the, the APIs that are being deprecated. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, the classic Google, classic Google move, which is to deprecate the old product before the new one has been released but at the API level. But in this case, like, you know, by design, they, they want to eradicate that permission. Like they've, they've made it pretty clear that they don't want ad blockers <laughs> to exist. And that permission allows you to do like, it's a pretty broad permission. So I kind of understand that, you know, it's a very, it's always, you know, when we were building Firefox, it's the most risky permission. Yep. Like it yep. gives an add on view into every byte that, crosses the network from, yeah. from the for, for, for people who are not familiar, we are talking about web request APIs, uh, especially like the blocking version, which lets you both uh, like inspect every request uh, that goes and every response that goes back. So you can ch check like headers, uh, companion is using that to tell, oh, this is a request for IPFS resource and I will redirect it to local gateway. Uh, and that's why we need this permission on every website. So every website can use uh, content addressing and it will be supported out of the box. Um, yep, we'll see what time, uh, what will, I'm waiting for manifest version three, at least to land to this nightly build of Chromium. So we at least can see what we are able to re-implement and what uh, functionality of companion will be lost. Because uh, right now we are not even able to participate in discussion because there's like no API draft, not even like a document with example of API. So we are not even able to like on a piece of paper just to prototype nothing. Yeah. Um, Huck, uh, do you want to talk about IPFS co uh, co host? Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, I just merged the PR to make IPFS co-host uh, compatible with the spec. So that I was wondering if we should release the 2.0 version of IPFS co-host or address some issues first. Um, such as testing or the bundling of GSIPFS. Uh, yeah, I, I have a sort of maybe, yeah, I have thoughts on that. <laughs> so my thoughts on that, are, um, if we release uh, it as 2.0 right now, yeah. uh, it will spawn embedded GSIPFS and will still include it as a dependency, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then we, if we decide to like convert this to a proper library, which yeah. is not bundling, then we need to like release 3.0 again, right? Yeah, that's true. Let me just check which is the current release version. Like if it, we could, if it's 1.0, yeah, it is. We could release 1.1 because there's no breaking changes. We only made additions and Oh, no, we removed the flag. Mm. There's a breaking change. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, like switch to 2.0 is uh, it's a good, a better idea because we effectively yeah. change uh, the entire backend how yeah. uh, those websites are hosted. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I think, I feel if we wait for like this decision or like refactoring JSAPFS out, it may be take more more time to be released. So maybe just release 2.0 and then if we decide to convert it to library, yeah, fine, then it's like 3.0. It's just a number, yeah. right? You are right. Let's ship okay. it. And then we could add it to co-hosting uh, spec uh, like repo. Yeah. Marking it green so people can like actually play with the spec without like so there's a value in releasing it you give a, a more polished implementation of co-hosting spec and we could start playing with it in companion and desktop um, yeah because it's is it a problem that is, like it's a problem for developer it takes more space like node modules takes more space but like ipfs companion uh, depends on js ipfs anyway IPFS desktop yeah. may add support to JS IPFS anyway at some point. So for our projects, it does not matter. And for other projects, PRs welcome. <laughs> um, that will be my approach, I think. Okay, I'll get it released today. Yeah, thank you. Dietrich, do you want to tell us about browser vendor design guidelines? Yeah, when, I, when I'm able to find that tab, it's somewhere here, I'll share it. So a quick dis discussion about the introduction into a project that we'll be doing over the next few months with a designer who will be joining us temporarily to work on this. This, the idea is that when we talk to browser vendors, they have existing web standards and design teams and security teams that at that intersection of security and user interface, design iconography and visual communication patterns for the things that we see in the browser relative to things we should be concerned about. So uh, is your connection secure or not? The, the padlock, very familiar with everybody. Uh, but whether they understand it or not, it's a whole different question. But either way, a lot of thought, a lot of practice, a lot of um, experience, and a lot of care goes into the treatment, the visual treatment of how things are communicated when a navigation event happens in the browser. So the idea here is that for IPFS, we have a set of uh, use cases about what IPFS provides in the browser. Uh, it's a uh, well-articulated threat model around the things that it needs to communicate, uh, uh, suggestions for UX patterns and interaction design patterns, 
and uh, recommendations and experiments in iconographic treatments for what types of icons should actually be in the URL bar when, when IPFIS is present uh, in a way that, that communicates the things that users may or may not need to be concerned about when loading uh, cryptographically verifiable yet can come from anywhere P2P content in a browser. For the first time, that's really ever happened in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, we can use these materials when we're talking to browser vendors uh, and when we're talking to standards bodies when we engage the W3C and the IETF uh, to communicate, uh, have, have something tangible to communicate and open a discussion about. Um, so far, you know, we've seen uh, several, you know, inter interactions where, you know, standards bodies are like, ah, oh, that, that's just, what you guys are just doing is crazy. We can just ask them to come to your world. So this is more of a, let's bring the mountain to them and um, very clearly state the problems that we're trying to solve and a set of and provide a set of recommendations, almost like a set of uh, instruction manual for them to follow or a design kit that uh, speaks the language of the, of the design teams that would be implementing this in, in browsers or very, very least reviewing it. So um, they're aiming to start hope, hopefully in the next couple of weeks on this work uh, and we'll definitely be presenting it here. The IPFS desktop and IPFS companion applications are, are the, the user facing uh, are, you know, artifacts of the IPFS project for the most part. So, uh, in, or at least for the internal work that we do. Um, so we'll probably be using those as guinea pigs to test out some of this material and up, uh, you know, experiment with applying it to how we're implementing user interface related to IPFS. Uh, but it should be, should be pretty fun and, and useful and something we'll hopefully be able to leverage uh, all through next year in our conversations with other partners. Uh, but just wanted to give you a sneak peek and heads up about that work that we'll be starting to see. Yeah, it's super exciting. And uh, especially like in Firefox, I see how Companion could be a, like a vessel for look, like implementing it and looking how it will look like. Because like in, in interesting facts, in uh, Chrome, you are not able to add both page action and browser action. So browser action is this button icon in the toolbar and the page action is also an icon but it's on the right side of location bar uh, address bar uh, sorry it's address because we are not location addressed anymore those days uh, yeah like like, like small new small nuances like that are are really important because that yeah. change that change in language does signify a pretty major or significant yeah. uh, protocol where, where, where the con where change. the content co comes from how yeah. many people are hosting it can i co-host it should there be an interface for co-hosting the, right there? Things like that. So yeah, it's exciting. Uh, brave plan, maybe, perhaps? Yeah, so one of the things we talked about at, at Browser Week was we identified the set of changes that would need to be made in order to be able to call the Brave integration a 1.0. Uh, what does is, what is done mean for that first set of work? Uh, so I figured this meeting is probably the right place. De definitely, this is about the right time since we're now mm -hmm. one third of the way through the quarter, and we had a goal of shipping that by the end of the quarter. Um, so this is a, probably a good time to do a, a quick review of where we are with regards to that work and what needs to happen next. So, um, you know, meeting with Brave and talking about either like you know joint blog posts where we announce the the you know ready, ready, ready for use launch, uh, as well as you know we we talk a little bit before too about maybe doing a, a deeper technical post that identifies the, the unique and innovative work that's been done to be able to make that happen. Yep. Uh, I can like give a quick, uh, very short overview and then we can discuss. So uh, there's a project called Brave in IPFS Companion repo, uh, which gives you sort of like uh, an overview of related tasks and what's ongoing and what's done. However, there's this in progress, this is the, the big meta meta issue, um, which has some challenges uh, already tackled, some are not. I need to go over this list again, because I've been not looking at this, mostly like working here and update this, uh, this project. But long story short, uh, things that remi re remained uh, to be implemented are local discovery for browser nodes. So um, right now embedded JS APFS is able to detect 
Go IPFS in local network, but it's not able to announce itself. There's this open problem of uh, uh, DNS discovery service being already uh, taken, like the port being already taken. That may be the problem with Polyfills, or it may be just a, a problem with uh, Chrome OS API. Uh, so it's something uh, I need to look at. Uh, what remains here to be done is to see if it can be addressed. If not, we probably need to add additional discovery methods just for like Chrome OS uh, nodes running in Chrome OS environment. Basically, all web browser nodes, uh, such as like Brave, they would have a additional discovery method on top of all the standard ones. So it's not like we are introducing something custom to replace the generic one. The generic one will still be there. Uh, we, when the node discovers other nodes, it runs all discovery methods in, in parallel and uh, gets all the results from all of them. Uh, I feel that's, that's the plan for addressing this and we should um, land this and the apart from that that's like the only like a miss, missing feature on our end uh the rest is mostly performance improvements uh so there are like quirks but like there are multiple issues related to performance improvements but honestly most of them fall under the problem with um ext ext extensive use of preload or delegate nodes so I introduced this throttling when you, we don't send more than four parallel requests. However, there are uh, like there are additional uh, limits in Chromium. Um, not this one, gosh, where is it? Uh, brave, brave, brave. Yes, I believe this one. Yeah. So it's like we are we are triggering anti DDoS protection at both uh, preload nodes now, and as well there is a separate. <laughs> I, I I believe, yes. So this one is our preload nodes throttling us, and this one is uh, Chrome itself is saying, "Oh, this extension is not naughty, <laughs> and it blocks." Uh, outgoing requests before they leave uh, your machine. Because uh, it turns out there's like a built-in uh, anti-DDoS protection. So if you have an extension which starts behaving uh, badly and there's like a heuristic here. So if you get multiple HTTP errors in some time window, your extension is blacklisted and it's not able to send requests. And basically the problem is our APIs are returning uh, HTTP error 500 if like DNS link is not present, which is like not very HTTP semantic. Um, it's like a technical depth from the time when uh, HTTP API was used only from for, by the command line client of the Go IPFS. Um, but now it has unexpected consequences like this. So, but you, you can see it's mostly like related to the fact that, that when we start, when your nodes start browsing, let's say Wikipedia, because all those errors I, I just show you, uh, those errors come from the fact that I loaded Wikipedia page and there are multiple pictures. And then each picture is one or more blocks and all those blocks are requested uh, using like dele delegated DHT queries, delegated content routing, peer routing. And that's like a lot of requests to the, our preload nodes. Um, so. Long story short, uh, do some. We need to figure out something about this. Either add better limits, like remove limits at our preload and delegate nodes. Uh, try to uh, add a heuristic on our end to be below this threshold of Chromium. Uh, so that's a mitigation. Uh, long term solution is to remove pre uh, delegated routing and replace that with native uh, DHT, but that won't happen this quarter. Uh, this quarter is basically focused on ASIC refactor, and if we are able to do that in JS land, that's a very good quarter. So we probably it will be at least six months before we have like 
test that and fully functional DHT in JS. So until that happens, we are probably need to solve the problem uh, on the uh, problem with delegate uh, delegated requests. Um, the, and the, the, the Chrome limitation heuristic probably should be implemented um, deep in the core anyway, right? Like there is, there is no circumstance under which we do not, uh, uh, that we want to surpass, that we want to hit that limit, right? Like. Uh, yeah, so, so that's the problem. Like uh, I understand uh, the, the one of fixes would be make our API to stop returning invalid error code make it like 404 maybe <laughs> that seems like a that seems like a much uh a much more aligned with the intent and purpose of those yeah. HTTP the, codes. The, the problem is like uh that requires change to go ipfs and the release to, of go ipfs and then it requires uh, that release to be installed on our gateways so it may be faster to address it temporarily at the yeah. uh, the level of our delegated routing modules because to, to me that seems like we want to make that go change as early as possible if it's going to take if it's something we know we need to do either way and it's going to take a while then it seems like maybe we should get that we should get that request in to go to prioritize that fix that that's the problem uh um, yeah that's uh, this like http 500 is a problem uh it's a big problem across entire API, because it's not just this one endpoint. Like entire API behaves that way, and all the HTTP clients expect that behavior. So you can see how fast we balloon the scope of this change. Uh, that's why I- I, I get it. I, address, I fully understand that should be fixed, but I am also realistic that before this gets fixed uh, in Go, and our gateways and our libraries, we will have DHT in JS <laughs> and we'll no longer need to uh, solve this problem. Uh, so that's me just being pragmatic, right? Um, All right, I, I understand. So I have another question, mm -hmm. uh, which is less about the contents of these things than maybe we, it then, then reframing what 1.0 means. We, like, we've kind of assumed that uh, so far that embedded node is part of 1.0 even though embedded node is clearly marked experimental uh, and actually not necessarily recommended for, for production use. So uh, I wonder if we are able to just maybe, if for one of the options that we have to be able to kind of make sure that we close up this work, uh, that also kind of aligns with how Opera is approaching it too, which is just gateway is their initial release. Mm -hmm. um, what if we pushed on the local network discovery bit for 1.0 and made that part of 2.0 when we have a kind of better understanding of what embedded node capabilities are going to be anyway and a better understanding of the performance and and uh, can resource consumption of that um, and instead fix some of these performance issues and then all that call that a 1.0 yeah because uh, it's not like uh, just to clarify it's not like without this discovery uh, two brave browsers are not able to discover each other and to exchange data. The problem is this discovery is facilitated by a centralized uh, signaling server. Uh, so that's... Which is how everything else works today. Yep. Uh, including our, our bootstraps now, nodes are basically the same thing, right? Like, very true. And uh, JSAPFS does not remember peers between restarts and all that jazz. So yep, uh, I agree. There's uh, something I hope to land uh, in v1 but now after we broaden the scope of this like browser design guidelines which will be created uh, i believe it's not we will also probably discover this uh, address bar uh, from the v1 that's probably for the next uh, next iteration uh, hopefully we will if we have guidelines we will provide those guidelines uh, to brave and then brave will implement uh, I, I like sort of like started this discussion, uh, like more, maybe not a started discussion, just like showed uh, the problem and a different direction in which we'll probably move, right? Like when you re remove local uh, gateway from the picture, uh, how do you present that in address bar? 
the, the green padlocks go away, what replaces it, things like that. I feel that will be the part of the design work you described. So I feel, uh, yep, that probably also will be uh, discoped from this. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think that makes sense. And what I think maybe what we should do is kind of like it is in very coarse blocks. We can think of like V1 of integration as things like uh, companion by default, uh, local gateway access, these types of things. Uh, you know, V V2 of browser integration. That next major step would be deeper deeper levels of integration, either in the UI or embedded node. Um, uh, and then, then like that final third layer, and I kind of laid this out in the browsers post as well. Yep. That final third layer is when we have a native implementation. Yeah, um, but that, that that middle one is more that deeper integration level is where things like a protocol handler would be or embedded node. So mm -hmm. I feel like in, if you chop it up into those course three stages, kind of makes sense. Oh anyway. yeah, and uh, in the V1, we still have like embedded node, but it's still clearly labeled as an experiment, uh, opt-in experiment. Yep. Uh, I, th I feel basically it's like solving the problem with uh, delegate and preload requests. Yep. Um, yep. Okay, so I think I think that means then so that these these couple of performance issues are going to be the the priority for Brave for the rest of the quarter, and then um, in our next meetup with them, we can talk about what a, maybe a unified like let them know about this phased plan. Uh, and then talk about um, when we want to, when we would expect to have those performance issues ready, when they would, and when they would be ready for a kind of like a joint announcement. Yep. I believe uh, I believe I have a sync with Brave this Friday, so I'll. All right. I will. Them on that. I, I will. I will. I will try to get up early. Yeah. Enjoy. Um, cool. Weekly teams stages. Yeah, this was actually just a note that I had about, um, you know, that we have the project operations meeting and then we have the now a, a weekly cross functional meeting where it's like uh, all of the different uh, working groups and project initiatives and efforts mm -hmm. share a status. And, you know, so I look at I look at this meeting notes and there's usually a lot of stuff. But um, one of the asks that I had for you all is when you note things here, maybe just put like a, a, a check mark or something for something that you would like to be highlighted in that weekly status. So there's always a bunch of different things landing um, and it, it's hard to keep up with all of that stuff. But one thing that would make sure that uh, we're providing the whole project with a view into the work that you are doing on desktop and on companion and even stuff where you're contributing to other parts of the project is to make sure to mark those and list those here and then that'll make it easier for us to be able to broadcast those wins and those achievements that you have made to the broader project so that everybody knows how amazing and awesome you both are. I was trying to add a section and now my hackpad is offline. Oh, now it's online. Uh, I think in the past, like when it was uh, with the GUI working group, uh, we had like a highlight section. So maybe we could like replace this like team updates with highlights and basically have uh, drop or just copy specific links there. Yeah, exactly. Just copy it up there. Because I think it's really nice to be able to see what you, the log of things that you both thought were important enough to know and your individual work stream as well. I think that's, that's totally cool. So if there are specific things that you're like, I, if people should know about this, then maybe yeah, pop that up on the top. Is that a correct word? I'll fix it later. <laughs> um, cool. Volker uh, notes for this meeting. Volker notes. So uh, Volker sent an email out um, or a Slack message or something like that about a system he came up with for using CryptPad and uh, like an auto meeting notes generator for it. Um, and I, oh, you might have a link. I've seen it, but I'm... <laughs> I know, I was looking for the link too before this meeting. I'm like, it's, I can't remember where he posted it. Oh. Uh, but I just thought I'd bring it up as something that we could look at to reduce the, the overhead of, of doing the, the notes generation. I would love for all of our IPFS meetings to have like one unified system that takes the manual aspect out of it. It's so manual just to post notes right now. Uh, I think sorry. it was an email. I'm sorry. I think it was an email to shift. Yeah, I yeah. found it. If you want me to share it or it's an email, I don't see any 
link. Maybe. Okay, it's published. I will send you the link. All right. And I, I don't think we need to make a decision or anything today, but it, I thought it'd be worth bringing up and looking at and asking the question. Maybe oh, we yeah. should decide, evaluate it. Oh yeah, I think like uh, I, I can try use it like this week for this call <laughs> and maybe give uh, feedback how it went. Yeah, so it's, I remember this. It's basically creating a PR, out, it's automating uh, all those manual steps. We usually I need to do uh, to publish this to IPFS team management people. Yep, we try to use it. When why do work when we can use robots? <laughs> That's the spirit. All right. Uh, also, my PFS policy. Uh, I, I believe it's a follow up for last week's discussion. Uh, yeah, and I forgot to edit first. Uh, yeah, so like, like yeah. To, just to remind, it's like uh, we have this awesome IPFS IO website. Uh, uh, I believe so. Does it work? It should work. Yeah. It does. So it's like different projects, articles, data set services uh, built or, or using uh, IPFS. Uh, and it's backed by a repo. And the problem is the repo uh has a lot of prs opened and we don't have a like, written policy what is considered awesome or not awesome uh, what's the threshold for including something into this, uh, this website uh, we did not I, I i did not look at it nor uh, wrote any thoughts on this policy did did you like have time to, to think about it? What, what could that be? Or should we like take it uh, async, just create an issue in, in awesome IPFS repo? So I'm, I'm trying to find it. There already is an issue about- Yeah, there is an issue already. From Victor from some years ago, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I, if you can like find it and, and add it to agenda, it will at least be like an action item to drop some thoughts on that issue yeah okay i just did and it's it's yeah this, this is something that would be it would be worth talking about in and when one of the things we should put at the top of the agenda because it could take some time and i think that's what we said last week too yeah i think we uh after this call, I probably put it at the very top for the next week. Yes. Yeah, let's do that uh, and, just, and, and dedicate and, 30 minutes to it. Yeah, and everyone will have time to basically get familiar with uh, the historical look, outlook. Because yeah, we need to like just spend time and, and tackle this and publish it. So, so at least we can include more people into reviewing. Uh, hack. What what are you confused about? So uh, let me just talk. okay. Um, apparently, like when IPFS desktop updates, it is supposed to connect to GitHub, check the latest dot YML file, check if there's a new release, and download it, which is normal. It uses HTTP, but this user apparently is some RCE. Uh, system I don't didn't know about I don't know what that is but apparently for some reason IPFS desktop is connecting to node uh, trying to download node and using git for some weird reason mm. I don't know how to check if that's really happening like this that specific uh, image is not wrong it should connect to github through HTTPS to download the binaries, so it's not. But the, the it part and the node part, that's something I don't know about. Because Electron has node built in, so I think it might be node itself checking if there are updates for node. I don't know if that can be the reason. I, I searched about it, I couldn't find anything about it. 
but it might be it. I don't know if Node itself checks for new releases. Yeah, it's uh, it's something we probably could look look deeper with a tool like Wireshark or TCP dump, like start uh, JS APFS. Is it like on Windows or is it? Yeah, that's Mac apparently, what? but uh, I don't know what RCE is, but uh, it's some system. It's a oh, remote code yeah. exploit, right? Remote. Um, no, it's like remote code like, execution. Execute. Yeah, yeah, remote code execution. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's pro yeah, okay. it's like it's like use useful tool, and I I agree. A lot of people may have this type of software running, and it may ri raise some eyebrows why IPFS is trying to connect to Amazon. Yeah, but Amazon makes sense because not on that specific screenshot, but the GitHub binaries are stored on, stored on Amazon, so that, but I don't know why node binaries, that's node binaries, <laughs> those are node binaries. Yeah, so that, that's, that's also like a, that, a thing. We are using GitHub which is like centralized service for publishing our artifacts instead of like using our gateway maybe, right? Because um, yeah. if, if the domain here was IPFSIO, I don't think he, this issue would be here or the discussion around this issue would be different. The problem is you have GitHub here, which is like owned by Microsoft, and then you have yeah he was really concerned about that <laughs> and then you have uh, aws which is owned by amazon and then you got and both are used by ipfs which is like sort sort of like trying to replace AWS, uh, aws s3 and i'm like yeah i i agree why why it could raise some eyebrows but i don't know if we are able to solve this assuming it's uh, like our upgrade mechanism which is like checking this url yeah. for updates it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if we are able to easily replace this because it's like uh, out of the box solution we are using for publishing binaries for, uh, I believe, Windows and Chrome, right? With updates. Also, I snap an app image. I think those. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but uh, I, I, uh, this. Auto update mechanism let us choose between GitHub, Bintray, or a custom HTTP website of our own. Like we could use this .ipfs.io eventually. Yeah, that is, so there's an issue about uh, about that on IPFS desktop. Yeah, if so, if we are able to like delete replace that with our like self-hosted solution, we should that do that. Uh, just to remove like those HTTP requests to GitHub and Amazon, uh, like we could run, have like a dedicated subdomain for that, like like updates IPFSIO or something. So in those tools, it's like self-descriptive hostname that removes like no. oh why this software is. It, we could call it like auto updates IPFSIO or something. Uh, and there's a value in that, uh, like all, like if you are running Tor node, you want to like have a specific host name that says Tor exit node, something, something. So when like network security people are inspecting stuff or in corporate environments, they like are like aggregating logs. And then in different city country, a person is looking at aggregated logs and looks at the host names that are repeated. Uh, those self-describing host names are super useful. Uh, okay. Could we use dist, reuse dist? We already have a dist.ipfs that I yeah, where we ship updates. The, the problem is like this uh, electron update mechanism is probably like requiring custom manifests to be published, right? And yeah. the, so we, we either need to do a PR to the dist repo or we need uh, like a separate domain. Uh, I'd say that that's not a, a topic for this call. We, we can like take the, this async and decide. But I, like personally, I'd, I see like a, a way to address this is to basically move to a self-hosted solution because uh, I fully understand why people get 
I'm comfy with this. <laughs> I, I, I like the idea that we're dog fooding, uh, yes. as well as the fact that we will never stop fighting those battles as long as the mission of our organization is to allow people self agency in owning their own data and being able to communicate without specifically that list of software companies. <laughs> I think that we will always be fighting that battle for as long as that we are, we are using them as infrastructure. Yeah. Apart from, uh, uh, apart from like, like security, the fact that you're sending to a third party request to a third party, uh, it's also like pretty bad optics. <laughs> So, uh, well, yeah. it, it's also it's also could be just bad for that person as well. Yeah, like not just optics, but it could be a, a it could be a threat to that person. That, it, that in, here yeah. in the U.S., that's a that's a clear and present danger. Yeah, that person could be targeted. The like a certificate for GitHub or something could be in theory replaced by some countries, uh, and the green padlock will still be there, right? Um, yeah, I I think like the uh, gist of this discussion is we need to look what's needed to switch to self-hosted solution. Uh, so if you remember, hack, if you remember, please write down. Uh, if, if not, we probably need to make this research. And or anything we need from like infra team, if we need, if it's like a static content, then it's much easier because we then basically just publish it to IPFS, create a DNS link to some host name. Uh, if it's like a dynamic website that you need to run some software, then we need to work with infra team. Uh, but it's still something we need to self host. Because uh, like more and more people will be using IPFS desktop and they will be relying on auto update mechanism. And that mechanism should be like, if it's supposed to ask third part, like third party, it should be like protocol apps uh, server. Uh, not like someone else, right? Mm, yeah. I'm checking the the Electron you know, the auto update section, and they say they support out of the box GitHub releases, Amazon, DigitalOcean, Bintray, and generic HTTP servers. Here's the idea. So it's, perhaps it's, it's, perhaps it's an opportunity to create. A provide a IPFS provider for Electron build to like publish releases to IPFS somehow. Just just an idea. Because if there's 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 needs to be so, sort of like a plugin system if they support GitHub and something else something else right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, there is. A, I'm sure there is. I've seen it some of the code before. IPNS, and I've heard IPNS will be fast really soon. So any moment now. And that would, honestly, that would be probably the best case uh, if we remove reliance on DNS for updates. But even if not, going with DNS link would be better than uh, going with GitHub. Yeah. All right, guys, I feel that's more or less a conclusion for that and also like for agenda, anything left? We got two and a half minutes. That was a, that was an action packed, high, high, high value, extremely productive 57 minutes. It's, it's incredible how we always manage to feel entire hour, no matter how many agenda items we have. Yeah, that's a skill. What, if if you change the meeting to half an hour, would we get the same amount? I think we of awesome did, things done. We we change it to half an hour, and we did not notice any change. It still takes one hour. <laughs> yeah, if it works. Did we change it in the agenda in the the calendar? <laughs> if I, it works, I why not change it? <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a good hour though, I guess yeah. was my point. That was an hour well spent. I see Hack is like making agenda for the next week. So I think we should end this week's one and see you all. I'm just adding also my PFS. Oh, I know. Like, bye. <laughs> so we don't forget that.